What you're about to watch is actually one of the most rare things that you'll see when it comes to debating between Christians and atheists. In this clip, you're going to see Frank Turek, who's you know one of the most well-known apologists of our day, at least in the Western world, talking with a young man named Nathaniel who's trying to make the claim that it is intellectually impossible to agree with the idea that there is a God, especially when it comes to morality. But in this clip, you're going to see Frank Turek gracefully, humbly, but how would I say this? Unashamedly dismantle this young man's argument. And the way that this young man responds at the end, this gives me hope for humanity. So I want to play this clip for you. I'll give a little bit of commentary and then I'll share some thoughts at the end. But you have to stick around to the end of this clip because the way that this young man Really, the light turns on for him in such a beautiful way. Really rare to see. So, enjoy. So, you make three specific arguments for the existence of God. A creative argument, an argument for design, and an argument for morality. I, first off, would like to try and take down the argument on morality. Right. Because it's not actually an argument for the existence of a God. It's the argument for the fact that we should have an idea of an existence of a God. Because otherwise there would be no moral basis from which we could sit on. And I disagree with that because I feel that humans are inherently altruistic and moral. Okay, all right, stop there for just a second, Nathaniel. What do you mean by altruistic and moral? We are giving and we care about each other. Why is that good? Why is that good? Because it helps our species survive. Why is it good to survive? Because then we can propagate and move on as a species and continue to exist. So why is that a good thing? Who said? Why is that a good thing? Yeah. Because that is what it is. Well, that's an is. That's not an ought, though. Stalin would say... Fine, Nathaniel. I'm going to survive. Well, let's, let's, let's pause real quick. We'll, we'll keep on going in a moment. But I want to break down what he's saying. So he's saying he doesn't believe, Nathaniel, that in order for us to actually be moral beings, that we need a God who actually writes the moral code, writes the moral law. He's saying that inherently there's something in us that is good, which we can talk about shortly after how we have an idea of what good is. But the Bible says that none of us are good, actually, which I'll talk about in a little bit if we get to it. But here we have Frank who's saying, what makes us good? Like, how how do you come up with that that idea that we are inherently good? Where does your framework, I should say, of good come from? So listen, uh, I'm going to pull it back just a little bit. We'll let Frank continue to carry the conversation. Fine, Nathaniel. I'm going to survive by killing you and taking your stuff. Why is he wrong? Because Stalin would have the initial urge not to. He would feel that the inherent urge of humans is to be caring for one another. There are situations where humans will not be caring about one another, and those are exceptional. But because humans are inherently altruistic, his first urge would be to take care of the person or try and help them. But if he has some motivation against that, then he would no longer have that urge. And he would decide that he wants to kill them because he has a reason to. Well, again, I think you're begging the question as to what altruism is. Why is taking care of others a good thing if there is no God? That's your opinion. Is there an external referent, an authoritative, unchanging referent that you're getting that opinion from, which makes it objective, or is it just something you feel? Um, So if you take it from the stance that this is something that is consistent throughout humanity, that we care about one another, then we could superpose that as a moral impulse that we have. Okay, let me agree with you. I think we do have a moral impulse. And that's exactly what C.S. Lewis said in The Abolition of Man, when he looked at all the diverse cultures and he said, they agree on basic morality. Now, how do you explain that basic morality? Well, there's maybe different ways to explain it, but some will say that's because God has written it on our hearts. But the issue isn't how we know it. The issue is, why is altruism, as you put it, or caring for one another a good thing? Who said? It's not necessarily who said, it is what is. We are altruistic. There is no need for someone to say that it is a good thing. It is what we are. But if Hitler or Stalin comes along and says, I don't want to be altruistic, I want to be selfish and take everything for myself, and if I have to kill you to do that, I'm going to do that, why is that objectively wrong? Because he is not taking care of other people. Who said it's, where are you getting this standard to objective, this objective standard that you ought to take care of people? Where does that come from if there's no God? So You see, you see what's happening? What we're, what we're arguing about here, or the discussion that we're seeing, this, har- this argument's happening all over the world, though. I had somebody reach out to me recently, uh, not well, not totally recently, last year he was saying, you know, that we don't need God, we don't need to have him be our standard of righteousness or goodness or morality in order to have morality. And I said, okay, well, then where where does your sense of morality come from? And he went on to go down the route of the Constitution, of the United States. I was like, okay, well, um, is that the ultimate source of authority? Was that, 
Like, where, where did that inspiration come from, right? Because we know, if you're an American, you know that the Constitution was written by men who were seeking after Christian values in the Constitution. And this is not even the point of the argument. But the point is, is that we go down this path of, like, where do these values come from? Why do you think it is inherently wrong to kill somebody? In fact, I would go as far to say, if you believe in Darwinian evolution, killing people especially if they're weaker than you, is actually part of the whole plan. It's part of the design, right? Survival of the fittest, natural selection, the weaker mutation of a gene or whatever dies out. That's perfectly normal. In fact, the faster it can happen, the better, so that we can continue to become a more advanced species. We know inherently that that's wrong, right? We want to take care of those who can't defend themselves. But where does that come from? I'll tell you right now, that desire comes from, as Frank said, it's written on our heart. God wrote the law on our heart, but we also know inherently that every person carries in within themselves an inherent dignity and value because they were all created in God's image. Nevertheless, if we don't, if we know that things are wrong, what makes them wrong? In order for them to be wrong, there must be a standard of right, right? Let's keep going. So I'm just going to talk about a little example that I know of and some others. So um, there's three different points I'd like to make. First off, we still exist. If we did not take care of each other as a social species, we would have very, very limited capabilities of still existing. We need to band together. We need to take care of each other. We need to be friendly to That's one That's presupposing another. that survival is a good thing. Why is it a good thing? Why us surviving? Why not roaches or antelope? or black widow spiders. Why do you need the concept of good there? We're still surviving and we're being nice, kind to each other. We're being caring for one another. It wouldn't Forgive me, Nathaniel, but you're stealing the standard of goodness from God's universe to try and make your worldview work. But if there is no objective, authoritative, moral standard beyond us, then atheism doesn't work. You know, I think you're right. There is something to that. So you make three- so, oh, like I know it happened so fast, but like, I wish it slowed down right there. Let's pull it back one second. This to me is the miracle. The miracle is you have this conversation happening and this young man, I give him all the credit in the world because today it's like, it's, it's hard to admit that you don't have it all figured out. Right. And I don't even have it all figured out. So I'm not going to pretend like I do, but to have the humility to say, you know what? I see where you're going with this. So beyond the fact that what this young man, as he's saying, you know what? And when you're talking about there has to be an authority that sets this moral code in place. I think I'm going to think about that further. Beyond that conclusion, what I'm super encouraged by is the discourse, the civil discourse between people who are not coming after each other's throat and like, you know, trying trying to condescend the other the, the other person. The whole point, by the way, of apologetics is to win souls, not to win arguments. If your goal and my goal is to simply win arguments, and by the way, like, you know, I've been in a place before where I've wanted to prove myself right, but let me tell you, there's a difference between being right and being righteous. And God wants us to have a motivation of, hey, if I'm going to engage in a conversation with somebody, let my heart's motivation be a motivation of love to win souls. That's one thing I love about Frank in his ministry. Um, but I want to hear what you think in the comments. What do you think about this argument? Maybe you're an atheist. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Keep it civil though. I want some civility in the comments, please. Um, but first I, I love, I love this conversation. I love this argument to me personally. I think it's a shoe in answer. We cannot have a, a standard for good unless there is a universal Standard, like you can't say that this is good or this is bad if it's relative, right? Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. If we're going to say that anything's good or right or evil or wrong, we need to first of all understand that can only happen if there is some sort of external authority that sets it in place and watch this and also judges according to our ability to withhold that standard uh, in which, as I was saying before, None of us meet. None of us meet perfectly, I should say. Romans 3.23 says this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means that we are all, we are, we are all guilty of breaking this moral, moral code, this moral law. None of us holds it perfectly. 
And the Bible says that the wages of our rebellion, our sin, is death. Not just in this life, but in the life to come. Hell is real. Jesus talked about hell more than anybody in the Bible. Why? Because he hated people. No, actually, he loved people so much that he preached the truth to set them free, died a death that they deserve on a cross, paying for their sin in full, that they might receive uh, righteousness and forgiveness and cleansing of their sin so that they could be restored in perfect relationship with this God who died on a cross, rose himself from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit, and holds the keys of eternal life to whoever would simply believe in him. So if that's you, I have another video for you. I want you to uh, click in the description. If you want to know where you're going to go when you die, are you going to go to heaven? Are you going to go to hell? Are you in right standing relationship with this judge of the universe? Or are you in wrong standing relationship? If you are, let me tell you, it's curable. But go watch that video. It's the most important question you'll ever be able to answer for yourself. And again, let me know what you guys think about this dialogue in the comments. Subscribe for more. I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.